cool. Thanks, Vance. Getting this pointer turned on. All right. Yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about empathetic design systems. So you're probably wondering who I am other than my name. I'm Jennifer Wong. Um, I'm a software engineer. I clearly really love animals of all types. Um, and I'm also a Mozilla tech speaker. So I work as a software engineer at Mode Analytics, and we're hiring. And we hire remotely. We're based in San Francisco. So if you're interested, definitely come talk to me. So to get started, um, what is a design system? How many people know what a design system is? Raise your hand. And then keep your hands raised if you have worked with a design system before. OK, a few people. So well, we're going to talk about what design systems are to get started. So design systems, um, they are super trendy. When I was looking up how far back maybe design systems went, I was able to find maybe all the way back to 2013. So it's been maybe six or seven years that we've been talking about design systems in tech. So UXPIN describes a design system as a complete set of design standards, documentation, and principles along with the toolkit, UI patterns, and code components to achieve those standards. I like to say that a rose by any other name is probably just a design system. So you've probably heard the terms before, pattern library, component library, or style guide. So going over those a little bit, um, they're actually all part of a design system. So a pattern library is a set of design patterns for use across an entire company. A component library is a set of commonly used elements across an entire company as well. And a style guide is static documentation that describes the design system itself. So it talks about how products should look and feel, use cases for the UI patterns that we described earlier, correct typographic scales, et cetera. So there are all types of design systems of all different sizes. The first one I want to talk about is Spectrum. Spectrum is created by Adobe. I first heard about it from Sarah Fetterman uh, at a conference called Forward JS. And here you can see every single iteration of an Adobe button. So like hundreds of buttons across every platform. So as you can imagine, Spectrum is really big. Um, there are many types of products that they all of their design system is used across. And uh, one other thing about them is I kind of stole this screenshot because they're actually a private design system, so don't tell them. Uh, this one is the US web design system, and it's created by 18F, which is a web consultancy that lives inside of the US government. So they work under the General Services Administration, and of course it's open source. This design system belongs to all of us, uh, as American citizens um, or people living in the US. So all of the government uh, products that you see that have been redesigned by 18F will be using this design system. And again, it's open source, so you can use it as well. Uh, another one that I want to talk about is by Mozilla. So they actually have a style guide. And when I first was looking up style guides and design systems uh, a few years ago, I found this one by Mozilla. And it was super out of date, but they've actually changed it. and it's super up to date now and really trendy looking. I think you can probably tell from the screenshot. It looks really, really nice. And it's also open source. And they actually also, in addition to their style guide, they have another design system or a design system which the style guide is part of. And this one is specifically for Firefox. So everything described in Photon will be used in Firefox and it's available on GitHub, also open source. So all types, you have private ones, public ones, ones for the government, um, ones that are open source. OK, so now that we've talked about design systems, let's talk about empathy. What is empathy? Um, empathy is people standing in the back who maybe want to come up here and sit down because there's a lot of seats. <laughs> I was like, I'm standing, so. <laughs> um, yeah, so empathy is actually the definition is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. If you look up the definition, um, it be, the, the word empathy comes from the words em and pathos in Greek, which means to be in feeling. And you can see from the Google Books Ngram viewer that the use of the word empathy has gone up in the past like 70 years or so, which is kind of interesting. We're super into, just like um, design systems, we're super into empathy as well. 
empathy, design systems, super trendy. So UX PIN actually did an industry report around problems um, that people experience in UX in general. They surveyed about 3,200 people, uh, most of which were UX and product designers and UI designers um, and other types of designers such as visual and interaction designers. And they asked, uh, what challenges do you currently face in your UX process? And what you see described here is improving UX consistency, um, testing designs with users, clarifying uh, requirements, collaborating between teams. So a lot of these things deal with communication between you and your coworkers or you and your users. Um, other things, legacy technology, um, securing UX budget or resources from higher ups. So again, like more communication um, and then also like replacing technology that's older. And then uh, getting buy-in and understanding from executives handing off designs uh, to developers and other. So again, lots of communication between you and like your users, you and your coworkers, you and higher ups in terms of getting more buy-in for your UX changes. So a lot of these things actually, because they deal with communication, they also deal with empathy, which can be thought of as teamwork, um, just like these dogs or this dog and this man working together. So it's kind of like the two dogs or maybe two engineers, a dog and like the man or developer <laughs> and designer, and like just having a general understanding for each other. So um, now we're gonna talk a, bit, a little bit about putting empathy and design systems together. So I wanna talk about uh, a company where I used to work and where I had been working on a design system as well. So why did they want to create a design system? Well, they wanted to look like way into the future. Back when we were starting it, design systems were still a little bit new, becoming like more popular and such. So they wanted to be in the future. And actually we were dealing with similar problems that were asked about in this UX PIN survey. The ones that we wanted to work on were improving UX consistency across all of our different products. We also needed to do a better job of like collaborating between teams and not just design and engineering specifically, but also between feature teams. And then also we were replacing legacy technology. So the timing of it was really good for us because we were actually going through a company rebrand at the time. So it's very good timing to start a design system. And we were also replacing both our old style guide, which we were using to guide us through different UX designs. Um, and also we were replacing Backbone with React as React started to gain in popularity. Um, I like to joke that we were primarily doing it for popularity reasons. The whole plan was to like eventually open source it and become famous for our amazing design system. So this is kind of what our uh, rebrand looked like. It was some explorations that were being done by our design team. So we were basing a lot of what we were gonna be building in our design system on these designs. And who was working on this? So we had our front end foundry team, which was a front end engineering team that kind of decided on all of the things that we would be working on as front end feature teams. So those consisted of um, three senior front end engineers and three entry level engineers who were coming out of boot camps. We had one product manager who was originally a design manager and the, the entire design team actually was working on it at any point in time. And that was up to like 15 designers at any time, which is a lot of people. The style guide that we originally had um, was pretty old school, and this is why we were replacing it. Some details about it, we used uh, KSS, SCSS, and CSS in our style guide. So you're probably wondering what is KSS? So KSS was a way of documenting our CSS um, and it would auto-generate documentation in the CSS itself. This is what it looked like. Um, it was a lot of comments in the CSS files. So it was a, little, like, a lot of stuff to read and it was like all in this one color, so difficult. Um, it was also, our style guide was very brittle. So there was no systematic way of adding new features or styles. You kind of just, you could add CSS willy-nilly wherever you wanted. Um, oftentimes, depending on the order of where you place things, uh, it sounds like someone has opened developers, developers, which is, check it out later, not right now, but. <laughs> um, 
So uh, when you added CSS, the cascade meant that you often overwrote styles that had already been created. Um, and then also the comment style section, like numbering was very strange and required some manual effort of like knowing where your styles got placed. So pointing those things out, you can see here, maybe you can't see, I'll read it to you, but um, there's dot button bright hover. So it's this hover state uh, in the comments that is being pointed out. And then what you see below is the input style and then the class with curly braces that just says modifier class. So I don't really know what the hover does or what it looks like. I don't know what these modifier classes is, are, like what are the modifier classes that are gonna go into it. And then here you see below style guide section 2.6. And it's like, what's in 2.6? I don't know. I mean, I guess it's probably buttons because it says buttons way up at the top over there. But it was very confusing. So what we wanted to do was have a shiny new design system. Nathan Curtis says that a style guide is an artifact of the design process, whereas a design system is a living funded product with a roadmap and a backlog serving an ecosystem. So this is something that we were trying to get right, like replacing the style guide so that we could have a design system instead. So some of the things that we got right, that we did well. Hooray. To start off, we used uh, what was called our component generator. So we used a um, library called plop.js, which basically creates a boilerplate of code files. So it would create things like your tests, um, the component files themselves, your CSS, like all in one folder. So it was a very structured way of doing it. It also told you we were using atomic design at the time. So you would choose whether or not you were creating an atom um, or a molecule or uh, the last thing, organism, yeah. Um, another thing that we did pretty well was we had pretty good documentation. Um, so we had some good onboarding documentation which talked about how to use the design system and how to contribute to the design system. And as I said, we were using atomic design. So we had documentation on what atomic design meant to us. So here you can see um, our folder structure. It's a little bit hard to read, but every component, or it's, excuse me, this is like our docs folder. So what you can see here is how to contribute, um, how to create a component, what atomic design means, getting started, your icons. So we had a lot of documentation on the design system itself. Um, the front end foundry team also created a, what we called a planned approach, which was a structured way of adding new components. Um, and what that meant to us was that you would get together with people from the front end foundry team and you would talk about the component that you needed to add. So we would talk about edge cases, we would talk about testing, et cetera. So again, a very structured way of creating a new component. I think in my proposal I said we didn't do a very good job of accessibility, which is not true. We actually did a decent job. So we focused very strongly on our modals because they tend to be uh, a sore subject, especially in the world of accessibility. They tend to be very inaccessible. Um, also, we made sure to use this plugin. Uh, we were using React at the time. so. It was a linter for our JSX to make sure it was accessible. So those are th things we got right. But then we also had some problems which typically stemmed from a lack of empathy. So the first one that we had trouble with was our search. Um, and you know what they say, you don't know what you don't know and that was absolutely true with our design system. So here you can see I'm searching for a dropdown um, and in the search, I see the result drop down and drop down menu. And I'm just like, um, what is the difference between a drop down and a drop down menu? <laughs> Aren't they the same thing? And I've already forgotten, because I don't work here anymore, <laughs> what the difference was. But there are two different things. Um, and similarly, so just like you don't know what you don't know, naming things is really difficult. So why, why did they name these two things so similarly? Couldn't they have named them something different? On the topic of naming things as well, um, we actually use the acronym EDS for um, the design system. And uh, acronyms in general are also inaccessible because if you don't know what it is, you don't know what it is until someone tells you or until you ask. And actually it was formerly called Black Panda, which was our code name for our design system, which is also kind of confusing. Another issue that we had was trying to figure out if something was deprecated. Maybe, I don't know. 
Um, so what you see here is the card list component. And what you see at the top is a banner that says, a uh, component is unstable and subject to change. But I look at that and I was like, what does unstable and subject to change mean? I, I don't know. Does that mean that I can still use it, but it might change? Or does it mean I shouldn't use it? Um, and I don't know what it means if it's like unstable. Also, if it's unstable, why is it in the design system? Another issue that we had um, was deprecation issues, uh, similarly, with uh, our inputs. So what you see here on the left is our text input. So a team, a feature team I was working on had built out this entire feature. We were using this text input, and it wasn't until we were completely done that actually the design team came to us and was like, oh, you should have been using the input field, which is over on the right. A completely different type of input field that we didn't know about. So it was a deprecation issue and also a communication issue where we didn't know that the text input was actually being deprecated at the time. So we actually had to go back and rebuild our entire feature to use these new inputs. Costs a lot of time and work. Um, another issue that we ran into was component confusion. Similarly to the text input and input field, like when and where should I be using these components? So what you see here is as I said earlier, there's the drop down and the drop down menu. Ooh, is that hard to read? I feel like it's hard to read because it's on white. Okay, well, then I'll just describe it. So the top um, left says drop down and drop down menu in a search. So again, I didn't know what the difference was between those two. And then below that, you see our drop down menu. And then up on the top left, you see a select. And then on the bottom of that, you see our select field. And presumably a drop down menu or a select is basically just going to be a component with like a little arrow that you click on and it like shows you a bunch of options. So I was like, why do we have so, so many different types? We have a drop down, drop down menu, select and a select field. And again, naming things is really hard. So I don't know what you all call this little animal over here on the right, um, but I call it a mountain lion. Anyone else? Cougar. I've also heard puma. Also, Mountain Screamer. <laughs> so what you can see here is like kind of an organization of our drop-down menus and selects. So even to make it even more confusing, the select field actually falls underneath the input field. So it's not even part of the select. Another issue we ran into was trying to find the CSS. So making sure that our designers could contribute to this design system. So here you see um, on our design system is really cool for developers because what we could do is you could show or hide React and show or hide markup. And that was really helpful for us to see the code of the components that, we were, being, that were being created. Unfortunately, that also meant that because we were using React, our CSS was buried inside of our component folders. So inside of our component structure, you can see the CSS lives inside of the component itself. And that means that if you're a designer, you actually have to go into the code base in order to see the CSS or the designs. Sorry, I'm going on a long time because there's a lot of things that we did wrong. <laughs> but here's another one. So we had um, our grid system as part of our design system. And then we also had alignment classes for if you wanted to align things to the left, right, top, or bottom. And what happened with these two things was that there were some unknown effects. So there was a widely created, widely shared new component that was created. And I had personally used it in a new feature, but started to change some of the styles and the CSS to um, match with the correct alignment and grid system. Unfortunately, this totally affected a bunch of other people's features that were using this component as well. Um, and then what happened was that there was actually a miscommunication between our grid sys or about our grid system and our alignment classes. So our grid system used display inline block. And then our alignment classes used display flexbox. And if you use both of them together, it causes huge conflicts. Just like this cat and this goat are in conflict. So editing those classes on a component that's being shared can cause a lot of issues for a lot of people. Um, another issue that we ran into was our release process. 
So with our release process, the way it worked was that our Fun and Foundry team would release a new version of a library once a week. And then they would bump that library uh, in the core repository, which required even more time. So that meant that feature teams would re were required to like wait and that would delay the features from being released. Okay, so those are all the issues that we were running into. So um, again, we have like all these problems that we were working on and we did a, do a good job of like improving our UX consistency of collaborating between teams a little bit, um, but we weren't very good at like clarifying requirements um, and handing off des designs to developers and such. So again, we're still having like some issues with our empathy and communication. So some of the solutions that we found were based on empathy, of course. So the plan for us was to actually have a better search. So to have better discoverability, in other words, like showing all of the components and like what they looked like instead of just like having a bunch of documentation um, and having, having to search just by words and knowing what the components are. So eventually the plan was to have that better search and discoverability, to have a smaller navigation bar so that you can see the components more immediately and have a search across an entire code base instead of specifically just for the component names. And then also the home page with screenshots of each component. Um, we started to like be better about naming things, so we stopped using code names and acronyms. Um, and some advice on that, like purge your code base of code names and acronyms, and then remember what those things are and that not everyone is gonna know what an acronym or a code name is, and then to make sure that you explain those things to people who are newer. Um, again, better communication. So share your communication cookies instead of hoarding them like Cookie Monster. So the way that we did that was we would have a front end guild, which were like meet weekly meetings with all the front end engineers so that we can share information about the design systems that were being released. Um, and then, or the new features that were being released. And then we also started a design system Slack channel so that we can communicate those things to people um, independent of those meetings. Also, uh, during one of those meetings, we actually discussed the difference between the grid system and our alignment classes to make sure that everyone understood when to use what and not to use them at the same time. And then again, with the text put and input field, like making sure that everyone knew when uh, new components were being created. Another thing that was actually planned at that company was to have component clarity. So we were going to have the designers actually create usage guidelines for each component. So when you should be using a component or how it should be used. Um, because I think just seeing it and seeing the code, it can be hard to tell like how an input field defer or differs from a text input, for example. Another thing that they were working on was using React Studio, which allowed designers to actually interact more with React. So what they could do was actually create a full design and actually that uh, React Studio would spit out the JSX and the CSS for those components that they had designed. Um, and then similarly, you can do the same with Framer. So that was another option that the engineers were playing or the designers and engineers were playing around with. Um, we started to also create a release process for everyone. So we actually had more information about how to release EDS and how to go about um, bumping that in core so that anyone could do it at any time instead of having to wait every single week for three engineers to decide when that should happen. So what you see here is some of the guidelines for the release process on the top. And then on the bottom, we actually had an engineer who created this bot which would actually ping you if you had a bunch of commits in the upcoming design system release to let you know that you had been nominated to release the new design system, which is pretty cool. It like involved everyone. So what should you do when you're working on a design system? You should totally empathize. Um, think about who's gonna use it. Uh, is it gonna be designers, maybe product managers, engineers, QA engineers? marketing, or even external stakeholders if you decide to open source your design system. 
Um, and then instead of like keeping information as an, on a need to know basis, making sure that you tell everyone about the things that you're working on. Again, writing like better documentation is super important um, and making sure that people know where to find that documentation. And also making sure when people, that people know when things have been deprecated or are obsolete, which is something Mozilla does really well. Um, also giving like a process to the way that you create things and how to make different things inside of your design system work. So having more of a structured process can be really helpful for creating new things that go into your design system. Um, some helpful tools that may guide you along your design system way are Storybook, um, which is a UI development environment. It's open source and helps you create uh, design systems mostly in React, but actually we're currently using it at Mode uh, with Angular, which is pretty cool. So here you can see it. I think this is an old GIF, so it's a little bit of an old version of Storybook. Um, but you can see the JSX and the styles on the right. And so what you can do is you can just click on it and like edit things right in there and it'll change the component being rendered on the screen. Another cool thing that came out fairly recently is Envision actually has this product called Design System Manager. So it helps you actually organize a design system from the design side. So it's like very structured and I'll show a screenshot of that in a bit. And then also UXPIN, which does a very similar thing to DSM. So what do we do at Mode? We're actually building out a design system currently, which is pretty exciting. I just started there maybe two and a half months ago. Um, so we're actually in the process of it right now. Unfortunately, our design system just started with a code name, which is Capra, um, and that actually means goat, I think, in Latin. And if you don't know, Mode's mascot is a goat named Marshawn. So that's why we're really into goats. Um, so let's talk about some of the resources that we have at Mode. So remember at that company that I worked for before, this is the list of the entire team that was working on the design system. It was up to 22 people at any given point in time. Whereas with like Mode's design team, uh, design system team, we're actually just three engineers, five front end engineers, one back end engineer, and we actually only work on this part time. So we only work on this on functional Fridays, which is a way of us to just work on side projects that help contribute to back to the company. So here you can see our team, which is actually just nine, and it's also part time. So what I say to anyone who is trying to start a design system is like consider the resources that you have before you start working on it. And also like build just what you need. Because if you build too far ahead of your needs, you end up with a catch-up machine like this. Like, oh, let's put it on some wheels and like let's get it some arms and we'll just make it, you know, put ketchup on your burger on its own. And that's not what you want. I don't think, maybe, maybe you do, maybe you do. <laughs> so building too far ahead of your needs usually results in like components you don't need, like the text input I was talking about earlier, components that don't meet your current needs um, because you don't actually know or you're not taking it into account, components with unnecessary extra features that you might just be adding on like those silly arms because you're like, oh, this, is, this will probably be cool and useful, but it's actually not. Um, and the other thing is it's, it can be difficult for you to account for the edge cases or all the cases in which your component will be used with, when you're doing things too far ahead of time. Remember text input versus input field. If you take nothing else away, just remember that. Um, so first things first, uh, let's build all the things. So for us, um, this is what our design system manager looks like for Capra. We actually have it organized on the design side. So the design team has created these categorizations. Um, so we have a getting started guide, which actually has like a ton of documentation about everything in our design system, which was really exciting to me because it's not something that we had at my previous company. And then you can actually see in brackets when things are actually done being designed versus work in progress, which can also be super helpful. So here you see um, a GIF of the documentation that our design team has created. And this is like, our design system is not really in use yet, and yet they have written all of this documentation of like how you should be using this, um, 
the way that people design things and like the design thought around our design system. The other thing about our DSM is it has those screenshots of each of the components that I had been talking about earlier that we wanted at our previous company, which is also really exciting. So you can tell at a glance the component that you're looking for and just grab it immediately from there. The other cool thing about DSM is that it integrates with Storybook, which we're actually also using at Mode. So here you can see one of the buttons that was shown earlier. And then we can play with this, um, play with this specific button and like use knobs to change different things and then just to grab the, um, the code directly from Storybook here and to use it in your product. The other thing that Storybook has here um, are some of the examples. So example element usage, um, different inputs that can go, inputs and outputs that can go into this component. So I have to give credit to one of the engineers, Anthony, for working on this because it, it is actually very difficult to integrate Angular into uh, Storybook right now. Most of the documentation is in React. So if you're using React, like highly recommend it, but also we're gonna be working on better documentation on the Angular side for Storybook for anyone who is working on that. Um, more advice I have for you is try to solve one problem at a time. So we had this one problem, colors. And a lot of us had problems with colors. And why is that? Well, it was because we had multiple color files and there was also, there were also these colors that were prefixed with the number 2018, which we couldn't figure out. So you can see that here. So we have colors uh, over here on the left and then colors uh, 2018 over here on the right. And I don't know if you can see, but for example, the blues are missing 100 and 300. They're missing 500 and 600, and I, I don't know why. And I'm like, when am I supposed to use, was I supposed to only use those in 2018? I don't know what those are for. So <laughs> empathize it. How do you do that? Um, Anthony, the engineer I had mentioned earlier, started working on building out design system colors with our design team. So what he has created here is a new DS colors, which is actually gonna replace both of the color files um, eventually. So we, I think he just put up the pull request last week, so it's very new. But what he's written here is like the documentation of these colors so that people know, like, don't just use these in 2019. Uh, use them from now on. And so right now they're prefixed with DS, but eventually what we'll do is we'll actually just use we'll just like cut off that prefix over time. And this has like empathy for who? This has empathy for all the de designers who might use these colors, uh, engineers who might use these colors, and then any content creator that might use these colors as well, because they're probably gonna be used on our marketing website as well. So design and engineering working together. Um, some other things that we're working on. So right now we actually have weekly meetings on those functional Fridays to discuss the things that we're working on, um, to update each other on the progress of our design system, and then also to update other designers and engineers on the things that they can start using from the design system. We just started discussing a release process and cadence two weeks ago, which again is like super exciting to me because the design system isn't currently used yet and we're already talking about how we want our releases to go. Um, we're also considering like where to store our static assets because they're probably gonna be used not just on our main web application, they're probably gonna be used by other applications within the company or even our marketing site. So we're really trying to consider that as well. And then I just saw actually today that Anthony, I've been out of town for a little while, so I just saw that Anthony is actually running a design system survey to ask around like how our engineers would like to use a design system. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, do as I say and not as I do, because as I said earlier, we didn't do that great of a job with that first design system I was talking about. So try to use empathy if you're creating a design system. Um, think about the users, collaborators, and the coworkers that you have and that may be using the design system that you have. And if you're still small, um, do as small companies do. Try to take it one step at a time. Like take care of the colors first, the 2018 colors first before you start creating a full blown design system. So use empathy, build what you need, also what your team needs. Start a component library, 
only when your team has time or you have a working group or you have enough people. And then solve one problem at a time, preferably a problem that affects a lot of people. And then I have a bunch of resources, which I'll post with these slides. And that's all I have for you. Thank you.